Good morning and welcome everyone. So nice to see you all. Smiles on your faces, traces of confusion on some of your faces because you thought you were coming to see Dennis Cooper here, up here weaving his spell. So as you know by now, it's my sad duty to report that Dennis is sick. And on top of that, he's lost his voice. So he's unable to be with us today. So when, when Dennis went down, the service associate sort of huddled up and, and tried to f figure out who could we get to replace him. And we thought, well, who can we find who kind of looks like him? <laughs> and, and, th and, and this is what the algorithm dialed up. In, in the ballpark, not as handsome, not as charismatic. You know, you came, you came for Neil Diamond and you got nearly Neil. <laughs> However, D Dennis is kind of here with us because from his sick bay he created the scaffolding for this service. And this morning Rebecca and I are going to build on it to offer you something pretty cool, I think. Something a little quirky, a little off plum, even for us. So, how are you feeling? Ready to go? All right. So, as I say, welcome to North Shore Unitarian Church. In this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life, no matter how you make your living or how you experience the sacred, no matter who you are or who you love, we hope you will feel welcome here. We appreciate and acknowledge our spiritual home on the unceded lands of the Coast Salish people, and we pledge to help make sure that acts of creativity and healing eventually outnumber acts of destruction here. Now, as we prepare to go down, down into the, the benthic depths of creativity, I ask you to first rise up, if you're willing and able, to join in song. Freedom is coming.
actually saved that, Allison. You just you stood up and applied the cardiac paddles, and we got going. I love it. All right, I'm going to re invite Rebecca um, forward to light our chalice this morning. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. Now, and, and two more candles here, the candle of joys and concerns. When we come to church, we bring with us big feelings, the joys and sorrows that are part of our daily lives. And as Rebecca lights this first candle, I invite you to take a moment and let those feelings sit with you. Now Rebecca was gonna light a second candle this morning the candle of global concerns. And now we acknowledge the unspoken sorrows that so many are, are bearing all over the world right now. So this, have a, 
have a close look at what's going on here. This is a boathouse in the Netherlands. Now, I don't know how you could look at that and not get goosebumps a little bit. Like, when a great idea, like that, that is a great idea. When a great idea, when a great idea, <laughs> When a great idea finds its way into the world and sows delight in everyone who sees it, that, can you see what, can, can people tell what's going on there? Okay. I think that that is darn close to a holy thing, an idea like that. And, and that is why you're hearing about this subject of creativity in church. Now, here's the part where I'd normally dive deep into the neuroscience of how studies show that religion lights up the same parts of the brain that children show creativity in. But I actually think religion is too narrow a frame for this. I don't think we're talking about religion or just religion here. Any, like, any kind of seeking fits the bill. Any kind of quest that's driven by curiosity lies at that mystic junction of the creative and the sacred. And in so, in so many ways, creativity is central to this project of Unitarian Universalism. Creativity runs right through our bedrock values, like generosity and beloved community and wonder. So in a teaser for this service this morning, Dennis said, creativity invites you every day to see the world anew. And I think he's onto something important there. Creativity, in this sense, is about paying close attention, opening your eyes to the little miracles happening right under your nose. So I've spoken up here before about my friend Ellen Langer, who is a psych prof at Harvard. Steven Pinker calls Ellen one of the most creative psychologists alive. And it's true. Her, her mind is like a gumball machine. I actually think she has... I actually think she has a lot of features of ADHD. She just bounces from one thing to another, and 90% of her ideas never become experiments because her grad students can't keep up. You know, they're just kind of, you know, most of it is just going by them. And I mention Ellen because she's, I think of her as sort of the, um, the paragon of kind of, um, just pure creative horsepower. And her main thing is mindful attention. That's, her, that's where she, she, she does most of her work. And that is really the art of tuning into what's going on around us. You know, the small changes that are happening moment to moment, that are happening to us and kind of happening in us. So you should hear her coach you on how to have a cup of coffee. She'll say, notice how you're holding the cup. Notice how you notice how you're holding the cup. Take a sip. What sensations and thoughts are arising? Feel the liquid in its downward journey. Notice that you are now one sip of coffee heavier. So that level of attention, if you can cultivate it, just makes you feel that you're living a richer life. It's what just about every Mary Oliver poem is about. And it is a learnable skill, seeing the world differently. I heard a cool story years ago from someone whose teacher had been a radar operator in the Second World War. And one day, the teacher was explaining what, a, what made that job so difficult. So you're out on the ocean on an aircraft carrier, and the radar signals come in on, a, on an oscilloscope but then you have to translate the positions onto a large glass viewing pane, which flips the image this way and this way. So your job is to process this information quickly and accurately in the, in the heat of battle, upside down and backwards. And the way the men trained for this was, they were sent to live for a while in upside down and backward town. It's a, classi a classified location where everything from newspapers to street signs was printed upside down and backwards. And what would happen as they got accustomed to that place is that it would break down their bias toward reading left to right, and now they could operate in multiple dimensions. And it's the same reason that nature photographers, and I think, I think some soldiers too, are sometimes trained to scan the horizon from right to left. 
because it goes against the grain of everything we've been taught since we were six years old, unless we went to Hebrew school. It breaks the trance of our conditioning, and suddenly sp things spring out that you could have passed right over. One photographer said, I learned to read each tree as if it was a, as if it was a syllable I was seeing for the first time. So it blows my mind that the way we see the world isn't the way the world just is. It, the way we see the world is just one interpretation and kind of a lazy one at that. Has, has anyone seen this film, newish film, Maestro, the Bradley Cooper? Yeah, he, there's a, right at the beginning, there's a quote from Bernstein that struck me as very Unitarian. Bernstein says, a work of art does not answer questions, it provokes them. And its meaning is in the tension between the contradictory answers. So that, that bears repeating, I think. A work of art does not answer questions, it provokes them. And its meaning is in the tension between the contradictory answers. I love the idea that creativity is about making things messier, not neater. Because that's a fairly radical proposition at a time like this. When the world feels like it's teetering on chaos, we crave answers, we crave resolution, but art doesn't offer that. Its value is in pushing us to ask better questions because that is the only way out. That is the road to depth, meaning, and purpose, asking better questions. That's what the creative impulse is all about. So there's an, there's an amazing poem and I'm sorry Lila isn't here today because she was the one who put me on to this. But there's a poem called The Opposites Game by Brendan Constantine. And in this poem, a teacher is standing in front of the class and they're doing a game of rapid fire antonyms. So it's like, tell me the opposite right now. My, your. Life, death. Loaded, empty. And then the teacher makes a little leap and writes on the board, gun. Hmm, silence. What is the opposite of gun? What is the opposite of a gun? And what would you, so what would you say? Don't think about it too much. What comes to mind? What's the opposite of a gun? A flower, that's what I said. What, what else? Peace. A heart. Handshake. Love it. So in the, in the poem, the students offer things like some of what you've already said, a book, a hug, a song, a prayer. One kid says, a promise, like a wedding ring, or a baby, or maybe the person who delivers babies, a midwife. And it's, and it's funny because the in the poem, the whole, the whole thing soon devolves into a shouting match. Each student convinced that their answer is right. And people, people kind of tribe up. There's the flower club over here, and the kitten club, and two boys calling, themse calling themselves the snowballs. And then one group emerges that starts turning the war of words into a war of art. Poetry breaks out within this poem. And someone says, it's a diamond, it's a dance. The opposite of a gun is a, is a museum in France. It's the moon, it's a mirror, it's the sound of a bell and the hearer. So in the end, what is the opposite of, of a gun? Well, in this poem, one possible answer emerges that not too many in the classroom can object to. The opposite of a gun is whatever it's pointed at. So I love that the students in this poem naturally gravitate toward working together in this game to make it kind of a collective project. Now, it's true that you can be creative all by yourself, but very often we can't be as creative as if we find someone to bounce ideas off or someone to absorb weird random ideas from, ideas that we would never have hatched on our own. A couple of years ago, a, a surgeon discovered a new way to treat burn victims. Now for decades, the treatment of burn victims hadn't evolved. And you tell me if I'm getting, I'm getting this right. The skin of cadavers, you got the skin of cadavers laid over top of you and you waited for months 
until that skin took and started sort of growing on you, in you, like, like sod. It was disgusting. But then this gentleman, this surgeon, was out strolling one night in Pittsburgh where he lived, and he roamed outside his usual loop into a neighborhood that was a little bit sketchier, and he spied some graffiti artists tagging a wall, and he noticed that they were getting a lovely, even coating of paint with those spray guns. And so was born the skin gun. It lays down a thin, even layer of stem cells mixed with a saline solution. And this revolutionized burn treatment. Now, if you're, now, if you're a, burn a burn victim, you get new skin not in six months, but in a matter of days. So that invention does not happen if that guy is sitting alone in the lab or in his house, in his silo. He would never have made that leap, never in a million years. The theologian Paul Tillich said, creativity is the power to connect the seemingly unconnected. And the wider you spread the circle of your interest, the closer you get to people who are really not very much like you at all, the bigger the potential payoff in a truly novel new thought. What's, inter what's interesting to me about creativity is that it, it isn't really an attribute. I, well, it kind of is. I've already claimed that it's a skill you can get better at, and, and it is, but, and we'll actually be testing that out in a moment. But what it really is is more like a stance. It's a stance, like an, a, a mindset, an outlook a mindset of openness. There's an American critic named Eve Sedgwick, and she says that there are two modes of engaging with the world. There's the paranoid, the paranoid mode and the reparative mode. It sounds a bit fancy, but stay with me on this. Paranoid mode is like this, and reparative mode looks like this. Paranoid mode is mostly concerned with avoiding danger by saying no, hedging your bets, double bolting the door. Reparative mode is about discovering and creating and connecting, saying yes and cool and let's give it a go. Even if you sometimes get burned or fall flat on your face or accidentally hurt someone else's feelings. Ouch, oops. I want to say paranoid mo mode is about playing defense and reparative mode is playing offense, but that doesn't quite capture it. A better metaphor is the way our man Austin Kleon puts it. Reparative mode is more about finding nourishment than identifying poison. In other words, living creatively is more about trying to be well than trying to avoid getting sick. Both are important, right? but one of them is kind of more important. As Austin says, you can identify all the poison you want, but if you don't find nourishment, you'll starve to death. And creativity is all about finding nourishment. That's what makes it vital and sustaining, but it's also about providing nourishment, and that is what makes it sacred. Generosity is sacred. The generosity that pushes us to create something and then just release it into the wild, into the flight path of strangers who may never know who made it, but will nonetheless be delighted by it. That is a sacred thing. So when Jean plants a butterfly garden, that is a holy act. When Stuart installs a stained glass window, that is a holy act. When L. Jean writes a poem, it's a holy act. When Marguerite paints a portrait, it's a holy act. When Carrie writes a song, or Allison arranges one, or Bob calls a square dance, those are holy acts. When Deanna lands a high C and holds it, and it's ripe and full, and you feel it in your shoes, that is a holy act. When Malcolm does a deft edit, or gel lays down a beautiful stitch. Those are holy acts. When Yasha styles the chancel for a Christmas Eve service that turns this little barn into a basilica, that is a holy act. We are all creators in here, every one of us. And 
On that note, it's time for the second, more experimental part of this, of this service. This is the quirky bit I learned, alluded to earlier. Basically, we're all going to try to get our hands into the cookie jar now in a way that I will let Rebecca explain to you how this is going to work. All right, are you feeling inspired to be creative? There isn't a no answer there, I'm just saying. That's one of those rhetorical questions. All right, three options. We are going to only do this for 15, 17 minutes. So even if you don't like the idea, it won't last long. And there's coffee and tea in the back of the sanctuary. So if you're really feeling anti the activity, you can, you can go get coffee and tea. But here's the options. First is music and rhythm in the narthex, the foyer. And that's um, Carrie that's going to lead that. We have a couple djembes and drums and some rhythm um, pieces out there. There are some chairs in there. So if that's interesting to you, um, you can head out that way. Don't, don't move yet. Number two. There's a beautiful long table, which from a distance looks like it's set up for dinner or lunch because of the, the glasses of water. But in fact, it's an art table. And Allison's going to lead a beautiful short art activity with watercolors. And the third option, you can actually stay exactly where you are in your seats. And we'll bring around some paper and pens. And on the, the screen will be some prompts, some writing prompts. So you can either sketch or you can write in response. So those are your three options this morning. Anything else? That's it. So, yeah, so um, writing people don't need to go anywhere. You can just sort of stay, sort of stay in your seat uh, here. And the art people can sort of gravitate over to where Allison is. And I see Carrie waiting out for the music people outside. And so what we'll do is we'll go to our, whatever station moves you and try it out. And after 15 minutes, we'll summon you back into the sanctuary with a gong. All okay. right. So let's go to these breakout areas. Ten people max over here for Allison. Unlimited number here for the writing. And I don't know, a dozen can go to the music. Okay, these are, are two potential writing prompts for you. Okay. As you see them up on the screen, write them on your piece of paper, and you can choose any of these writing prompts. Whatever speaks to you, whatever sort of seems to look like it might spark something, that's a, a prompt you can use. Yeah, and, okay. Do you want to go through them again, Rebecca? Just okay. Okay, yeah. Go backwards then. First, yeah. Write about the moment. This is my favorite. Write about the moment after which everything was different. Or these. Finish these sentences. Unitarians should. Or, I find I'm no longer afraid of. And you fill in the blank. Write about your first memory. This was a hard one. Your first memory of an elevator or a camera. You would have been really little. So you're going to have to dig deep for that one. And the final one was write about something you used to do with your parents that you later started doing with your own kids or your grandkids. OK, so once, yeah, I won't, I'll shut up now. And we'll just uh, let you go to town. And we'll bring you back to Earth with the sound of the gong in, in 12 minutes.
The art people have asked if they could continue to paint while we're uh, while we while we finish up the service. It's like when you asked to if you could keep eating your dinner in front of the TV. The answer is always yes to that. Um, so how did we find that? Did it did it uh, did something unlock? Did you end up in a place that you didn't expect to be when you started? Yeah, some of it. Yeah, they were kind of neat prompts, and I wish if we had more time, we would uh, we would be able to debrief on what we created. Um, but but we got, we gotta kind of keep moving here. So save what you've written and uh, and come back to it. it you, there may be a germ of something really great there. Um, so thank you so much for um, participating in that. It's amazing, right? What your brain can come up with once you prime the pump a bit. And since everything is flowing now. It's probably the time to invite the ushers to take, <laughs> to take the offering. <laughs> Do we have ushers? Okay. Sorry, I'm pulling everybody away from their, um, from their task. 100% of our offering plate collection today, unless otherwise noted, is going to look out housing and health society whose aim is to transform the lives of the unhoused. More subsidized housing, better subsidized housing, and social service and employment opportunities to put folks on a trajectory when they, where they need never be unhoused again. Please give as generously as you are able. For these gifts of life and love, we lift our hearts in thanks today. All right, we've got a lot of announcements today. So first up, down with fast fashion. After the service today, the Environmental Action Team will be airing an episode from the CBC program Planet Wonder about what happens downstream when you buy cheap crap from H&M and the like. That'll be good, that'll be good. Also, right? 
at 12. Okay, so, oh, okay, so they'll, you know, have a little coffee and then come back up. Fund Fest, two great words that go great together. We need to get the ball rolling again on this, so anyone with Fun Fest ideas or to find out more about what Fun Fest is all about, please contact either Leslie Gibbons or the church office. As always, you'll get a tax receipt at the end of the year for the amount of money that your event brings in should we get this going, and we will. Clothing Swap. By popular demand, the Clothing Swap will be returning this spring if you're feeling in need of a wardrobe update. Put April 13 on your calendar. 20 bucks to participate. Two minutes for looking so good. Nobody remembers that ad, that old uh, Maurice Richard Grecian formula ad. Hey, Richard, two minutes for looking so good. If you like today's service, you will love next week's service, and it's about yoga, nidra yoga to be precise. And Allison is running it, and Allison's going to tell you just a little bit about what that is. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, um, following the service I did before where I talked about the development of uh, Unitarian Universalism and also what it might be now in a sense of being a faith that is not an exclusive faith. It's a place where everybody can come together and experience a sense of delight in who they are and who they might become. Um, and somebody, Suzanne, came up to me and afterwards and said, but can you tell us how to do that? And this word has been coming to me, which is be in the now, be in the now, being present. And, um, and then a friend of mine on Bowen said, I've started doing this yoga nidra. Yoga nidra is a way of embracing, it's really a guided meditation, and I did one with her, she guided me through it, and it was incredible. It was like one of those moments like where you're being massaged and you sort of stop breathing. It's just so incredible. And I said, oh my God, this is about being in the now, being here, being present. And so I asked her if she could come and do a 20 minute med guided meditation session for us. So next week, Bring a cushion, if you want, against your back. If you want to lie down on the floor and you believe that you can get up again, then I recommend bringing a couple of pillows so you can feel comfortable about lying on the floor. There are some young people here who can give you a hand and get you back up off the floor. Um, so we will have, she'll talk about it for about five minutes and then do a guided 20-minute meditation in yoga nidra. So um, there, that's it. And I just, as a bit of medical, I just want to promise you will keep breathing and you'll definitely start breathing again. Just Nice. And following Allison's service, it will be Super Sunday, so come with an appetite. Delicious homemade soup arranged, as ever, by the great Diane Hicks. Serving soup, making soup, that is a holy act. Chow down for a small suggested donation. All right. Um, and as if that weren't enough next week, and by gosh, don't you think it ought to be? Al, um, we've got, uh, after you've had your soup, you can head back upstairs where the social justice team will be holding a meeting to discuss health and mental health in this community in the context of our social justice priorities here at NSUC. And the following week, uh, January 28th, you'll definitely want to be here, not just because it's the highly touted possibly first annual generation service, but because after the service is a budget meeting, we, may, we need to make some decisions about how to divide up our modest pie in the coming year. Um, one final note that's not on the slide is oh, the welcome table. After every service, we invite people who are new-ish to the church to stop by the welcome table for coffee or tea. Board, me board members will be there to informally chat, share, and answer questions. Look for the table with the white tablecloth. You gotta do what the Spirit says do. You gotta do what the Spirit says do. Spirit says to, Spirit says to, Spirit says to, Spirit says to.
We created something here today. We created lots of little things individually, but we created something collectively. It's not tangible, but it's very real, and we will carry it with us when we go out for the rest of the day and the rest of the week until we meet again. And just before we extinguish, extinguish the chalice, I'd like to offer you one final thing, if I may. It's a prayer that came through across my desk in the last few days, written by an acquaintance of mine named Courtney Martin. And she calls it Prayer for a New Year. May we be at peace. May we draw on the connections in these communities together to organize for local and national leadership that mirrors the best of who we hope to be rather than those who appeal to our fears and tribalism and cynicism. May we do, may we do something rather than nothing when we get all up in our heads. May we be more grounded in our bodies. May our hearts break open. May we ask, is this mine to do? May we love the earth not as an object, beautiful nature to pass through, but as a complex, miraculous subject that we build a relationship with. May that relationship include reckoning, nurturing, and a long-term commitment to do less harm. May we do small things that help us build muscles for the heavy lift of climate transformation. May we listen to experts who acknowledge their own confusion and evolution. May we have friends of a variety of generations and listen to all of them with equal respect and curiosity. May we make and appreciate art. May we write over-the-top fan letters to the artists that move us. May we wear clothes that make us feel beautiful and powerful and get haircuts that make us want to dance. May we get better at clean apologies. May we remember that other people legitimately do not experience the world the way we do and see this as an asset, not a deficit. May we delight in even the mundane, especially in the mundane. May we scan for quiet kindness. May we love and be loved. Thank you all so much for coming today. We extinguish this flame. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. And now we'll circle around.